Section 7 of Scott's Last Expedition, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Armstrong. Scott's Last Expedition, Volume 1. The Journals of Robert Falcon Scott, arranged by Leonard Huxley. Second part of Chapter 3. Land. The Landing. A Week's Work. Whilst we were on shore, Campbell was taking the first steps towards landing our stores. Two of the motor sledges were soon hoisted out, and Day, with others, was quickly unpacking them. Our luck stood again. In spite of all the bad weather, and the tons of sea-water which had washed over them, the sledges and all the accessories appeared as fresh and clean as if they had been packed on the previous day. Much credit is due to the officers, who protected them with tarpaulins and lashings. After the sledges came the turn of the ponies. There was a good deal of difficulty in getting some of them into the horse-box, but Oates rose to the occasion, and got most in by persuasion, whilst others were simply lifted in by the sailors. Though all are thin, and some few looked pulled down, I was agreeably surprised at the evident vitality which they still possessed. Some were even skittish. I cannot express the relief when the whole seventeen were safely picketed on the floe. From the moment of getting on the snow they seem to take a new lease of life, and I haven't a doubt they will pick up very rapidly. It really is a triumph to have got them through safely, and as well as they are. Poor brutes! How they must have enjoyed their first roll, and how glad they must be to have freedom to scratch themselves! It is evident all have suffered from skin irritation. One can imagine the horror of suffering from such an ill for weeks without being able to get at the part that itched. I note that now they are picketed together, they administer kindly offices to each other. One sees them gnawing away at each other's flanks in most amicable and obliging manner. Mears and the dogs were out early, and have been running to and fro most of the day with light loads. The great trouble with them has been due to the fatuous conduct of the penguins. Groups of these have been constantly leaping on to our flow. From the moment of landing on their feet their whole attitude expressed devouring curiosity, and a pig-headed disregard for their own safety. They waddle forward, poking their heads to and fro in their usually absurd way, in spite of a string of howling dogs straining to get at them. Hello, they seem to say, here's a game. What do all you ridiculous things want? And they come a few steps nearer. The dogs make a rush as far as their leashes or harness allow. The penguins are not daunted in the least, but their ruffs go up and they squawk with a semblance of anger, for all the world as though they were rebuking a rude stranger. Their attitude might be imagined to convey, oh, that's the sort of animal you are. Well, you've come to the wrong place. We aren't going to be bluffed and bounced by you. And then the final fatal steps forward are taken, and they come within reach. There is a spring, a squawk, a horrid red patch on the snow, and the incident is closed. Nothing can stop these silly birds. Members of our party rush to head them off, only to be met with evasions. The penguins squawk and duck as much as to say, What's it going to do with you, you silly ass? Let us alone. With the first spilling of blood, the skewer gulls assemble, and soon, for them at least, there is a gruesome satisfaction to be reaped. Oddly enough, they don't seem to excite the dogs. They simply alight within a few feet and wait for their turn in the drama, clamouring and quarrelling amongst themselves when the spoils accrue. Such incidents were happening constantly today, and seriously demoralising the dog teams. Mears was exasperated again and again. The motor sledges were running by the afternoon, Day managing one, and Nelson the other. In spite of a few minor breakdowns, they hauled good loads to the shore. It is early to call them a success, but they are certainly extremely promising. The next thing to be got out of the ship was the hut, and the large quantity of timber comprising it was got out this afternoon. 
And so, tonight, with the sun still shining, we look on a very different prospect from that of forty-eight or even twenty-four hours ago. I have just come back from the shore. The site for the hut is levelled, and the erecting party is living on shore in our large green tent, with a supply of food for eight days. Nearly all the timber, etc., of the hut is on shore, the remainder halfway there. The ponies are picketed in a line on a convenient snow slope, so that they cannot eat sand. Oates and Anton are sleeping ashore to watch over them. The dogs are tied to a long length of chain stretched on the sand. They are coiled up after a long day, looking fitter already. Mears and Dmitri are sleeping in the green tent to look after them. A supply of food for ponies and dogs, as well as for the men, has been landed. Two motor sledges, in good working order, are safely on the beach. A fine record for our first day's work. All hands start again at 6 a.m. tomorrow. It's splendid to see at last the effect of all the months of preparation and organisation. There is much snoring about me as I write, 2 p.m., from men tired after a hard day's work and preparing for such another tomorrow. I also must sleep, for I have had none for forty-eight hours, but it should be to dream happily. Thursday, January 5th. All hands were up at five this morning, and at work at six. Words cannot express the splendid way in which everyone works, and gradually the work gets organised. I was a little late on the scene this morning, and thereby witnessed a most extraordinary scene. Some six or seven killer whales, old and young, were skirting the fast flow edge ahead of the ship. They seemed excited and dived rapidly, almost touching the flow. As we watched, they suddenly appeared astern, raising their snouts out of water. I had heard weird stories of these beasts, but had never associated serious danger with them. Close to the water's edge lay the wire stern rope of the ship, and our two Eskimo dogs were tethered to this. I did not think of connecting the movements of the whales with this fact, and seeing them so close, I shouted to Ponting, who was standing abreast of the ship. He seized his camera and ran towards the flow edge to get a close picture of the beasts, which had momentarily disappeared. The next moment the whole flow under him and the dogs heaved up and split into fragments. One could hear the booming noise as the whales rose under the ice and struck it with their backs. Whale after whale rose under the ice, setting it rocking fiercely. Luckily, Ponting kept his feet and was able to fly to security. By an extraordinary chance also, the splits had been made around and between the dogs, so that neither of them fell into the water. Then it was clear that the whales shared our astonishment, for one after another their huge hideous heads shot vertically into the air through the cracks which they had made. As they reared them to a height of six or eight feet, it was possible to see their tawny head markings, their small glistening eyes, and their terrible array of teeth, by far the largest and most terrifying in the world. There cannot be a doubt that they looked up to see what had happened to Ponting and the dogs. The latter were horribly frightened and strained to their chains, whining. The head of one killer must certainly have been within five feet of one of the dogs. After this, whether they thought the game insignificant or whether they missed Ponting is uncertain. But the terrifying creatures passed on to other hunting grounds, and we were able to rescue the dogs, and, what was even more important, our petrol, five or six tons of which was waiting on a piece of ice which was not split away from the main mass. Of course, we have known well that killer whales continually skirt the edge of the flows and that they would undoubtedly snap up anyone who was unfortunate enough to fall into the water. But the fact that they could display such deliberate cunning, that they were able to break ice of such thickness, at least two and a half feet, and that they could act in unison, were a revelation to us. It is clear that they are endowed with singular intelligence, and in future we shall treat that intelligence with every respect. 
Notes on the Killer or Grampus, Orca Gladiator. One killed at Greenwich, 31 feet, teeth about 2.5 inches above the jaw, about 3.5 inches total length. British quadrupeds, bell. The fierceness and voracity of the killer in which it surpasses all other known cetaceans. In stomach of a 21-foot specimen were found remains of 13 porpoises and 14 seals. A herd of white whales has been seen driven into a bay and literally torn to pieces. Teeth large, conical and slightly recurred, 11 or 12 on each side of either jaw. Mammals, Flower and Lydecker. Distinguished from all their allies by great strength and ferocity. Combined in packs to hunt down and destroy full-sized whales. Marine Mammalia, Scammon. Adult males average 20 feet, females 15 feet. Strong, sharp, conical teeth which interlock. Combines great strength with agility. Spout, low and bushy. Habits exhibit a boldness and cunning peculiar to their carnivorous propensities. Three or four do not hesitate to grapple the largest baleen whales, who become paralysed with terror, frequently evince no efforts to escape. Instances have occurred where a band of orcas laid siege to whales in tow, and although frequently lanced and cut with boat spades, made away with their prey. Inclined to believe it rarely attacks larger cetaceans. Possessed of great swiftness. Sometimes seen peering above the surface, with a seal in their bristling jaws, shaking and crushing their victims, and swallowing them apparently with gusto. Tear white whales into pieces. Ponting has been ravished yesterday by a view of the ship seen from a big cave in an iceberg, and wished to get pictures of it. He succeeded in getting some splendid plates. This forenoon I went to the iceberg with him, and agreed that I had rarely seen anything more beautiful than this cave. It was really a sort of crevasse in a tilted berg parallel to the original surface. The strata on either side had bent outwards. Through the back the sky could be seen through a screen of beautiful icicles. It looked a royal purple, whether by contrast with the blue of the cavern, or whether from optical illusion, I do not know. Through the larger entrance could be seen, also partly through icicles, the ship, the western mountains, and a lilac sky. A wonderfully beautiful picture. Ponting is simply entranced with this view of Mount Erebus, and with the two bergs in the foreground and some volunteers, he works up foregrounds to complete his picture of it. I go to bed very satisfied with the day's work, but hoping for better results with the improved organisation and familiarity with the work. Today we landed the remainder of the woodwork of the hut, all the petrol, paraffin and oil of all descriptions, and a quantity of oats for the ponies, besides odds and ends. The ponies are to begin work tomorrow. They did nothing today, but the motor sledges did well. They are steadying down to their work and made nothing but non-stop runs today. One begins to believe they will be reliable, but I am still fearing that they will not take such heavy loads as we would hoped. Day is very pleased and thinks he is going to do wonders and Nelson shares his optimism. The dogs find the day work terribly heavy, and Mears is going to put them on to night work. The framework of the hut is nearly up. The hands worked till 1am this morning, and were at it again at 7am, an instance of the spirit which actuates everyone. The men teams formed of the afterguard brought in good loads, but they are not yet in condition. The hut is about 11 or 12 feet above the water, as far as I can judge, I don't think spray can get so high in such a sheltered spot, even if we get a northerly gale when the sea is open. In all other respects, the situation is admirable. This work makes one very tired for diary writing. Friday, January 6th. We got to work at six again this morning. Wilson, Atkinson, Cherry Garrett and I took each a pony, returned to the ship and brought a load ashore. We then changed ponies and repeated the process. 
we each took three ponies in the morning, and I took one in the afternoon. Bruce, after relief by Rennick, took one in the morning and one in the afternoon. Of the remaining five, Oates deemed two unfit for work, and three requiring some breaking in before getting to serious business. I was astonished at the strength of the beasts I handled. Three out of the four pulled hard the whole time and gave me much exercise. I brought back loads of seven hundred pounds, and on one occasion over a thousand pounds. With ponies, motor sledges, dogs, and men parties, we have done an excellent day of transporting. Another such day should practically finish all the stores, and leave only fuel and fodder, sixty tons, to complete our landing. So far, it has been remarkably expeditious. The motor sledges are working well, but not very well. The small difficulties will be got over, but I rather fear they will never draw the loads we expect of them. Still, they promise to be a help, and they are lively and attractive features of our present scene, as they drone along over the flow. At a little distance, without silencers, they sound exactly like threshing machines. The dogs are getting better, but they only take very light loads still and get back from each journey pretty dead beat. In their present state they don't inspire confidence, but the hot weather is much against them. The men parties have done splendidly. Campbell and his eastern party made eight journeys in the day, a distance of over twenty-four miles. Everyone declares that the ski sticks greatly help pulling. It is surprising that we never thought of using them before. Atkinson is very bad with snow blindness tonight, also Bruce. Others have a touch of the same disease. It's well for people to get experience of the necessity of safeguarding their eyes. The only thing which troubles me at present is the wear on our sledges, owing to the hard ice. No great harm has been done so far, thanks to the excellent wood of which the runners are made, but we can't afford to have them worn. Wilson carried out a suggestion of his own tonight by covering the runners of a nine-foot sledge with strips from the skin of a seal, which he killed and flensed for the purpose. Note from the glossary. Flence. To cut the blubber from a skin or carcass. I shouldn't wonder if this acted well, and if it does we will cover more sledges in a similar manner. We shall also try Day's new underrunners tomorrow. After forty-eight hours of brilliant sunshine, we have a haze over the sky. List of sledges. Twelve foot, eleven in use, fourteen spare. Ten foot, ten not now used. Nine foot, ten in use. Today I walked over our peninsula to see what the southern side was like. Hundreds of skewers were nesting, and attacked in the usual manner as I passed. They fly round, shrieking wildly, until they have gained some altitude. They then swoop down with great impetus directly at one's head, lifting again when within a foot of it. The bolder ones actually beat on one's head with their wings as they pass. At first it is alarming, but experience shows that they never strike except with their wings. A skewer is nesting on a rock between the ponies and the dogs. People pass every few minutes within a pace or two, yet the old bird has not deserted its chick. In fact, it seems gradually to be getting confidence, for it no longer attempts to swoop at the intruder. Today, Ponting went within a few feet, and by dint of patience managed to get some wonderful cinematograph pictures of its movements in feeding and tending its chick, as well as some photographs of these events at critical times. The main channel for thaw water at Cape Evans is now quite a rushing stream. Evans, Pennell and Rennick have got sight for meridian distance. We ought to get a good longitude fix. Saturday, January 7th. The sun has returned. Today it seemed better than ever, and the glare was blinding. There are quite a number of cases of snow blindness. We have done splendidly. Tonight all the provisions except some in bottles are ashore, and nearly all the working paraphernalia of the scientific people, no light item. There remains some hut furniture, two and a half tons of carbide, some bottled stuff, and some odds and ends which should occupy only part of tomorrow. Then we come to the two last and heaviest items, coal and horse fodder. 
If we are not through in the week, we shall be very near it. Meanwhile, the ship is able to lay at the ice edge without steam, a splendid saving. There has been a steady stream of cases passing along the shore route all day, and transport arrangements are hourly improving. Two parties of four and three officers made ten journeys each, covering over twenty-five miles and dragging loads one way, which averaged two hundred and fifty to three hundred pounds per man. The ponies are working well now, but beginning to give some excitement. On the whole they are fairly quiet beasts, but they get restive with their loads, mainly but indirectly owing to the smoothness of the ice. They know perfectly well that the swingle trees and traces are hanging about their hocks, and they hate it. I imagine it gives them the nervous feeling that they are going to be carried off their feet. This makes it hard to start them, and when going they seem to appreciate the fact that the sledges will overrun them should they hesitate or stop. The result is that they are constantly fretful, and the more nervous ones tend to become refractory and unmanageable. Oates is splendid with them. I do not know what we should do without him. A whole host of minor ills besides snow blindness have come upon us. Sore faces and lips, blistered feet, cuts and abrasions. There are few without some troublesome ailment, but of course such things are part of the business. The soles of my feet are infernally sore. Of course the elements are going to be troublesome, but it is good to know them as the only adversary, and to feel there is so small a chance of internal friction. Ponting had an alarming adventure about this time. Bent on getting artistic photographs with striking objects, such as hummocked flows or reflecting water in the foreground, he used to depart with his own small sledge, laden with cameras and cinematograph, to journey alone to the grounded icebergs. One morning, as he tramped along, harnessed to his sledge, his snow glasses clouded with the mist of perspiration, he suddenly felt the ice giving under his feet. He describes the sensation as the worst he has ever experienced, and one can well believe it. There was no one near to have lent assistance had he gone through. Instinctively he plunged forward, the ice giving at every step, and the sledge dragging through water. Providentially the weak area he had struck was very limited, and in a minute or two he pulled out on a firm surface. He remarked that he was perspiring very freely. Looking back, it is easy to see that we were terribly incautious in our treatment of this decaying ice. End of chapter 3